Today's episode is sponsored by Verve. For more details on how to get yourself a 30-day ad-free trial of Verve Premium, click on the link in the description below. At this stage of Spyro the Dragon's life, he has quickly become a household name in gaming. The first two titles were massive successes, and within a span of only two years, Spyro was right up there with Crash Bandicoot as a platformer name that should be taken seriously. Spyro 2, in particular, took everything that the first game did and made it way better in my opinion. More varied gameplay, level layouts, tighter controls, what could a third game possibly bring to the table? Spyro 3, Year of the Dragon. Thankfully, this one doesn't have any sort of weird name changes across regions. That's always nice. But actually, this game was released in the year 2000, the literal Year of the Dragon in the Chinese Zodiac. You gotta give Insomniac credit where credit is due. They saw an opportunity, and damn well they seized it. I made my opinion pretty clear in the last video that I think that Spyro 2 is the best in the trilogy. That's not really a universal opinion though, a lot of people say Spyro 3 is the best. So enough with the jibber jabber, let's dive in and see why some people think that way. Back in the realm of dragons, an evil plot unfolds. As it is also the year of the dragon in the game, a celebration is being held where new dragon eggs are brought into the realm. However, a mysterious rabbit girl, Bianca, invades with an army of Rhinox and steals all of the eggs! Not without accidentally waking everybody up at the end. Of course, you were so, so close. And of course they give chase, but Bianca makes her escape regardless, and she makes her way back to her leader, the Sorceress, to inform her of their success. A plan is then devised to send Spyro and Hunter through the hole into the quote, forgotten realms to recover all of the eggs and naturally stop whatever Sorceress is doing along the way. It's a bad guy, he's just doing the bad things. Spyro's gotta stop him. That's three games down, three games with basically the same plot. It's not really a bad thing, necessarily. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Platformers are usually always about collecting stuff, so just point me in the right direction and I'll go ahead and do that. That new character, Bianca, is pretty cool though. I'll give her that. She has a bit of a character growth throughout the story. And Sorceress is a pretty likable bad guy, so it all works for me. And then we dive right into the first homeworld, Sunrise Spring. And from here, yeah, things are pretty standard. Some story progression does happen throughout the worlds now instead of just in between them. But other than that, yeah, you just, you run around, you collect stuff, and then you jump into different levels and you do the same thing there. That same idea goes for the controls too. Spyro keeps all of the moves that he learned in Spyro 2. They don't pull any sort of Metroid shenanigans here. Though, he does end up losing that sick double jump exploit. I know that was never really intended to be in the game in the first place, but man, it, it will be missed. While most of the game does remain the same, that is certainly not a bad thing. It is still just as satisfying as ever to collect as many gems as you can. And going back to how the first game worked, gems once again come out of enemies. None of that weird soul removal nonsense. And all of the different worlds that you travel to are populated by NPCs as well in need of assistance. Like before you got a wide group of cutesy characters just clearly living in agony until this one small purple dragon pops in to save the day, you all know the drill by now. Hey, wait a second. Those cool little cutscenes that used to pop in before and after levels also don't return. Any story that a level tries to tell is now just told through a text box. And that's fine, I guess, but I'm a big advocate for charm in a platformer. That doesn't mean a game needs to be more cute to be better, but something like Spyro 2, those cutscenes made it seem like those characters existed before and after Spyro came through. Since that doesn't exist now, the characters are just walls of text. It's not really a game breaker by any means, but it's certainly disappointing. Though now you can attack all the NPCs, that kind of makes up for it. The main collectible this time around comes in the form of, of course, the dragon eggs. And rather than just being the egg itself, each one has a unique name that shows up just as they hatch right before your eyes. Aw, that's adorable. Most of the most of the time, 
So the way that these are handled are kind of similar to both Spyro 1 and 2, actually. Some of them, like the crystallized dragons of before, are just there to pick up as soon as you can find them, while many others see the return of the challenge and mission setup of game 2. Doesn't matter what level you're in, man, there is no telling what kind of shenanigans Spyro will get himself into. Uh, so here, the sun needs to be reignited with these cool sunglasses emojis. You get to play hockey again, similar to Spyro 2, but this time you play with live cats that you freeze in blocks of ice. Because why not? Insomniac Games definitely wasn't going mental at this point. And probably the biggest new addition, skateboarding. Radical, dude. So yeah, Spyro can skate now. Why not? You get to do score challenges, partake in racing, torch unwanted lizards, the typical stuff that you would expect. It's weird, that's for sure. Considering how popular Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was at the time, why not steal an idea from that? Okay, you can also enter in a cheat code that lets you skate on a squid. That's a, it's totally worth it in my opinion. Gotta say, I do love how these games are set up, but man, I would have loved to be at the board meetings when they decided just what they were gonna have you do. Like there's this one where you have to defend a ballerina who's performing her set despite like an entire hockey team wanting to take the ice for themselves. There's no real good or bad guy in this scenario. Is she taking up time when the hockey player should be playing? To be fair, the hockey players clearly just want to beat her up with their sticks. I, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, man. Oh yeah, and this is a good one. In the level Desert Ruins, the character that you save is a Lara Croft parody called Terra Croft. And she also just has the same animations as Bianca. All right, sure, dude, whatever you say. Naturally, the flight levels return as well, now including the standard collecting challenge that we're all used to. Hunter is hidden around each of them, offering a challenge where you now get to play as him instead of just being assisted by him, still providing gameplay styles seen nowhere else in the game, so that's, that's pretty cool. And brand new to these levels, races. It's a pretty standard three lap race, there are speed boosts that you can go through, there are missiles that you can get to shoot the opponent right in front of you, it's, it's about as good of a race as you can expect from something like this. Okay, that's right, I forgot, sound balancing wasn't a thing back in the 90s. What were we talking about? But the game's claim to fame, or flame, cause he shoots fire, haha, <laughs> is now. Spyro sets an example only to be followed by Sonic Adventure in the future. Brand new friends. So another returning face here is Moneybags. Pulling an EA or Activision, just putting stuff behind paywalls, and in each homeworld, he is guarding over a different locked animal. You pay off the big dumb bear, the newly freed friend, then knocks him out. Every time, it is very, very satisfying. And then, you get to play as them. There's Sheila the Kangaroo, Sergeant Bird the Penguin, Bentley the Yeti, and Agent Nine the Monkey. All of their levels are basically structured the same but they of course play pretty differently. Sheila can make really high jumps and attack with her feet, Sergeant Bird can fly around and shoot projectiles, Bentley can whack things and reflect projectiles with his club, and also walk incredibly slowly, he's, he's the worst one of the group. And lastly, Agent 9 has a laser gun that he can shoot and basically be like a blueprint for Ratchet and Clank in the near future. Some of these characters are also required in spiral levels to fully complete, and you know what that means. Backtracking. The same sort of challenge idea applies to these characters too. You never know what these characters will be up to. This is, there's like, there's side-scrolling, okay, sure, there's a whack-a-mole, because I guess that makes sense for Manly to do with his club. You can attack these, like, cat witches. Okay. Oh, hey, look at that. Even Spyro 3 can play Doom. There's this boxing mini game with Bentley that is just the bane of my existence. There's no rhyme or reason to anything that you try to do here. You just kind of keep mashing buttons and you hope for the best. But apparently that minigame can actually be played with local multiplayer. 
I mean, I, I say apparently. I read that online, so it has to be true because <laughs> I've, I've never been able to convince anybody to play it with me. And that's not all. There's even one more new character on top of all this. Sparks the friggin' Dragonfly, your health meter has his own set of levels too. Top-down shooters where Sparks, I guess this whole time has been able to shoot projectiles from his mouth or something? Would have been real nice if he had told us about that sooner. These levels are just okay. Easily my least favorite parts of the game. They just kind of feel like a slog. There's only four of them. They all basically play the same way. You go and get colored keys to open up colored doors. Oh, hey, there's Doom once again. And really, 100% completion aside, these are still worth completing since they unlock one new ability for Spyro. One of them gives you an additional hit point, then you can collect gems from further away. There's the ability to have sparks point you to nearby gems, which you could always do in Spyro 2, but you couldn't in this one from the start, thanks a lot Insomniac. Honestly, in my opinion, the game has just too much going on for it. Having variety is awesome, that's what makes any platformer thrive, but to me, this game sort of plays off as variety just for the sake of it. There's been quite a bit of speculation as to why Insomniac stopped making the Spyro games. One of the more popular theories is that because Spyro has no hands and really can't pick anything up aside from his mouth, they ran out of ideas of what they could do. And considering how many gameplay options are in Spyro 3, I can certainly believe that. Doesn't mean that what we got was bad, once again. Most of it's pretty good. Most of it. Specifically, just most of it. When it comes to the aesthetics and the soundtrack, the game holds up just as well as Spyro 2 does. Since we got a bunch of new, varied areas that we haven't seen before, as well as getting a new handful of characters, there's just a whole lot going on here visually. Sure, the PlayStation 1 does show its age a couple times, terrifyingly so, but then sometimes we just get amazing gold right after. What did I just watch? We also finally get to see the four homeworld idea, as opposed to the previous game only having three with a rumored fourth one. And all of these are based on a time of day, sunrise spring, midday gardens, evening lake, midnight mountain. Similar to the seasons idea of the last game, this kinda just gave the developers an excuse to make really nice and varied homeworlds, and I'm a big fan. And of course, we get a great soundtrack once again too. Although, not only thanks to Stuart Copeland, but also with the help of a new face, Ryan Beveridge. Regardless of having a new composer on board, things sound just as good and Spyro-y as before. And also, the music to Fireworks Factory exists, and the game kinda deserves a 10 out of 10 for that alone. Actually, this would be as good of a time as any to bring up the Greatest Hits version of the game. So for those of you who don't remember, normally whenever the Greatest Hits banner showed up, and it's really, really ugly green. It was simply a reselling of the game that signifies that it sold really well. However, in this instance, it was practically a vintage update patch. While it did fix a few glitches, here's the kicker. You see, the original version of the game that I have repeats music tracks in levels where it really shouldn't play, as the soundtrack wasn't really completed at the time of release. The most notable example, all of the speedways play the same exact track in the original, that bum bum ba -bum 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 -bum. it's, it's all four levels. However, in the Greatest Hits version, each one has a unique music track. Also, this one cutscene just straight up doesn't play in the original game. Period. You can only watch it via a cheat code. Ultimately, it's not really a big deal, though Sony released the original version on the PlayStation Store as opposed to this one. Confusing move there. It's really just a unique part of Spyro and PlayStation history. So, by completing levels, one of the NPCs will follow you back into the homeworld to assist in building a flight vehicle to transport you over to the next world. Your new animal friends even assist you in the boss battles. It is actually a really neat touch, in my opinion. All the people you save pitch in together and help you back out. That's cool. And of course, not everything is hunky-dory all the time. In between every world is a big, bad boss to tackle. Now what's really interesting is that we finally have some mid-level bosses as well. None of which are really all that threatening, but they fit the bill for being a mid-level boss. It isn't until you get to the big bosses 
that you fight some really creepy looking things. These are honestly freakier than anything that Spyro has seen so far. Scorch, in particular, genuinely kind of scared me when I was a kid. Look at this thing. They actually followed the wish that I had back when I was making the Spyro 1 video. The bosses are technically enemies and other critters that have been beefed up due to the sorceress's magic. Kind of similar to Yoshi's Island. And here it really works out, since the bosses make sense in the context of the game's universe, and it makes the sorceress seem more powerful and threatening, cause man, she can just do that on a whim? But luckily you are clearly not alone in this adventure. On top of everyone else that you're friends with this time around, even Bianca has a change of heart, slowly going against the sorceress's orders, seeing that what she was doing was purely aiming for power above all else. Seems weird she would follow her plan in the first place, but hey, she probably sounded like a good idea at the time, I don't know. Hell, at one point in the game they kidnap Hunter, and then she gets a thing for Hunter and helps him escape. Okay, sure, you know, I, I didn't think a game like Spyro would get a romantic subplot, but uh, why not? They look great for each other. Watch out, Bianca, he's an idiot. Eventually, Spyro makes his way to the sorceress herself. And uh, so in, in the original version of the game, the music that plays is the theme of Sunrise Spring. Um, what a way to ruin the atmosphere. Also, the fight is incredibly easy and simplistic. You jump on these vehicles that drop down from the sky, you shoot her a bunch, and that's it. The cheery music definitely doesn't help, but at this point, Riptail can for sure claim that he is the most threatening villain of the trilogy. The sorceress then falls into a pool of lava and quote, burns to death. Spoilers, not dead. And then in another throwback to Spyro 1, Spyro gets interviewed about his victory. I, li I like that a whole lot, actually. <gasps> oh, Alora! Hey, baby girl, where you been? Oh, I, mi I miss you so much. And they, te they tease a bit of romance between her and Spyro. I know I was just crapping on Bianca and Hunter. That's just because Hunter's an idiot. I like him. He's just really stupid. This, I, I am totally down with this. We get a bit of a good glimpse at what everyone has been up to since the adventure ended. The credits roll, once again being exactly the same as the first two games, rounding off the trilogy perfectly, and then you get to burn the crap out of money bags. Oh hell yeah, you greedy Ursign. Years of annoyance, two games worth of penny pinching, this is what you get. Burn, burn, burn. <coughs> <coughs> uh. It's, it's a good, it's a good reward. The final reward then becomes accessible, and it is the super bonus round. In yet another throwback to Spyro 1, there is a lot of those here, this level sorta plays like Nasty's loot. You just run around and collect a bunch of gems, defeating a bunch of thieves along the way, you open up a lot of doors that have these gem limits to keep progressing, and you even take on a few extra challenges. Awesome idea! But oh god, the skating challenge is the worst. You gotta get in first place in this race, right? And if you mess up just once, you may as well just restart on the spot. Every jump you take, you gotta make a bunch of spins, you gotta boost at all times, basically making your hand a pretzel for the entirety of the race. It doesn't matter how many times I practice this, it is always so, so painful. It sucks. And then at the end, you get to take on the sorceress one last time. There's no cutscene leading to it or whatever. I mean, we saw that she survived the lava, but uh, she's just here now. Okay, and now it's a UFO battle, but it's it's a fight that's even easier than the last time. Okay, yeah, that's it, that's it, it's really quick. Man, that's probably the weakest finale of the trilogy, to be honest. You do get a dragon egg with two dragons in it, so that's pretty cute, at least. The elder dragons then get to finally enjoy the presence of all of the baby dragons capping off an otherwise fantastic trilogy. The story would directly continue on, but I, 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 don't, re I don't really want to talk about that again. There's a new roundup of skill points to go for, rewarding you once again with a new set of cute little images. The same group of cheat codes are possible to pull off in the pause menu at all times. Another Crash Bandicoot demo is here, this time being Crash Bash. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that finally covers it.
Spyro Year of the Dragon certainly has a lot going for it. I mean, there's a ton of variety, like there's skateboarding, five extra playable characters, there's more bosses than the last game. But to me, I feel like it just tried to do too much. Sure, Spyro 2 had a lot of variety too, but it never felt like the developers were stretching themselves too thin. Here, oh yeah, oh yeah, they definitely were here. It helps that the characters that they created are super charming, and it is certainly not bad by any means, but this is the reason that I still prefer Spyro 2 over Spyro 3. And while the Spyro games would continue on, unfortunately, Insomniac would no longer be involved. Despite them having created Spyro in the first place, Universal Studios are actually the ones who owned the rights. Insomniac Games would go on to work directly with Sony to make Ratchet and Clank, while Spyro... Uh, by going in-depth thoroughly with the trilogy, I hope this explains what made these games special, and show you why the later mainline games just all missed the mark. These originals had such a great blending of gameplay mechanics, colorful landscapes, variety, up the wazoo, really fun soundtracks, they were just overall great packages. And whatever the game set out to do, it did it really well. Thankfully, this mentality would go on to the Ratchet & Clank franchise, but maybe I'll save that for another day. You know, it did feel really good to talk about this trilogy again. I may do this in the future, redoing some old games that I've talked about. I feel like I do a much better job now, so uh, hope you guys hope you guys think the same way. And now that I've talked about the originals, all we gotta do is wait for the Reignited trilogy, and it's coming soon. All we gotta do is wait a few more weeks until September 21st. Oh. Okay, that's that's a while away. Um, guess I'll watch some Verve instead. For those of you who are not aware by now, Verve is a media hub built around culminating media channels of all different types to appeal to fans of video, film, anime, and more. And it is available on multiple devices, so you got many choices. By clicking the link down below or going to verve.co slash antdude, you will get an ad-free trial of Verve Premium for 30 days. And on top of that, you will be able to watch your favorite shows without an internet connection. And new to the platform, and I'm sure if you liked the video, you may be a 90s kid, therefore you're gonna love this, your favorite Nickelodeon shows are now there as well. You got Doug, Cat Dog, Angry Beavers, Rocket Power, Rocco's Modern Life, oh, and there's a whole lot more. How, how awesome is that? I've said it before and I will say it again, the reason why I keep plugging Verve is because for one, they allow me to do so, but also because I genuinely really like this service and use it all the time. Back in the day, I used to go back and forth between 90s cartoons and games like Spyro, all the time. So now, if you use the link below or go to verve.co slash antude, you can do the same. And that's a pretty cool deal in my book.